So Jim Warren has been NC Warren's executive director for about the past 20 years and has provided amazing leadership for all of us. From the effective media coverage of important issues like the slow death of the nuclear renaissance, the importance of rooftop solar to combat climate crisis, finding a viable option for cleaning up all of the coal ash pits in North Carolina without causing further harm to people and the environment, Jim's leadership has been invaluable. And now to introduce Dr. Schlesinger, I want to call on Jim Warren, who we should give a warm hand of Yeah, we're really excited and honored um, to have Dr. Schlesinger join us here this evening. Uh, some of you caught some of the uh, background from uh, Bill in some of the promotional materials. He is uh, Dean Emeritus of Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences and President Emeritus of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a past contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and a specialist in the impacts of rising carbon dioxide on plant species. We've long admired Dr. Schlesinger as one of the rare and courageous scientists who is willing and eager to engage in the public debate over important social issues. A few years back, some of you may remember that uh, Dean Schlesinger served as NC Warren's expert witness and helped us in a regulatory proceeding to defeat approval of one of two giant coal-fired power plants that Duke Energy had proposed for Cliffside, North Carolina. Um, and that's NC Warren. We, we did that working alongside a number of very strong ally organizations. Uh, the Nicholas School calls Bill Schlesinger one of the nation's leading ecologists and earth scientists. He continues to analyze the impacts of humans on the chemistry of our natural environment. We are really glad to have him back in North Carolina, at least part-time. We're going to have to share Bill and Lisa with uh, the good people of down east Maine. Uh, but uh, they're around here for uh, a lot of the year, and we're just really honored to have Dr. William Schlesinger tonight. So thanks, uh, Jim. That uh, It's fun to be back, see old friends, and uh, learn our way around Durham again, which is not easy. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I have been hanging out at the Nicholas School, so I get to, to uh, participate in a number of things at Duke as well. Um, so I want to bring you up to date a little bit on at least where I see us standing on climate change. I want to spend most of the uh, night tonight thinking about impacts, a little bit on what we may want to do. Um, but I want to start off with a, with a few uh, observations, I think, of where we stand in this, uh, I'll call it a debate. Uh, I don't like to use that word when it really is uh, revolves around science, but that's really what it's become. Uh, but I think there's some, there's some points of agreement uh, across the country. Um, for instance, uh, I think everybody now, even the Wall Street Journal, uh, will agree that carbon dioxide is rising in Earth's atmosphere and is higher than it used to be. Um, and almost everybody uh, agrees that that rise in carbon dioxide has come from burning of fossil fuels. In other words, that it's unusual. It hasn't come from uh, volcanoes or some other uh, source. Um, you will see uh, some publicity recently that the um, emissions for the globe, all the countries of the world, uh, were basically flat last year. That's a very uh, helpful sign. Uh, but you don't want to interpret that, uh, that we've cured the problem, because as long as emissions are flat, uh, carbon dioxide will continue to rise in the atmosphere. A certain fraction of the emissions every year remains in the atmosphere. So we've got to do better uh, than having emissions go flat. We've actually got to turn, turn the curve over and start downward. Um, I think almost everybody believes that the temperature has risen on the planet over the last few decades. Um, you know, there's probably less universal uh, consensus there, but it's hard to disagree with the 
uh, nationwide network of, of climate stations and satellite measures that look down on the planet. And I'll show you a little bit of that evidence tonight. Uh, there's some controversy as to why there's been a hiatus of warming, why uh, the trend of warming is, was flat for the last 10 years while CO2 rose. Um, and that, you know, that's what people like me and, and other climate scientists uh, spend their time thinking about. You know, how could this be? The, what does this mean? It, it causes us to question uh, every time uh, we hear an argument like that, to question uh, how solid uh, the evidence that we're talking about might be. Um, I'd also say there's a point of agreement that continental ice, uh, ice with land under it, uh, is shrinking. You know, most of you have probably seen the pictures of Glacier National Park, which uh, uh, shows dramatic shrinkage. Uh, certainly Greenland has uh, shown uh, greater melt rates uh, every year. More of it is melting off in the summer uh, and uh, less of it coming back in the winter. Antarctica is still listed as controversial. Uh, I think there's been some disingenuous interpretation of the data around Antarctica. That certainly the uh, Antarctic Peninsula, the part that any of you that have been to Antarctica, uh, that's where, the, where you go, uh, has melted back quite dramatically. Uh, East Antarctica, the central bulk of the continent, uh, has actually accumulated some snow. And, of course, people pounce on that and say uh, that's you know, evidence that the warming isn't, isn't real. Uh, but overall, the uh, satellite measurements of the mass of ice in Antarctica, uh, the, the melting in the peninsula exceeds the buildup in the central part. So Antarctica looks like it's also losing uh, ice and snow, although probably less, uh, uh, it, it makes less of a picture uh, in newspapers. Um, North Carolina legislature aside, I think there's no question uh, that most people believe sea level is rising. Um, and actually, the legislature here d d does not uh, deny that it's rising. It, it just denies that the rate of rise might be increasing. Um, so, uh, you know, can some consensus that sea levels rising ac uh, across the country and around the world? Um, and, uh, of course, we also see that sea ice in the Arctic uh, is melting. And you want to be very careful. Uh, clear to understand the difference between continental ice, in other words, ice with land under it, from sea ice. Sea ice is floating on the ocean surface. And the same way that if you melt uh, an ice cube in a full glass of Coca-Cola, it won't overflow, uh, that's the effect of, of the melting of sea ice, uh, sea ice on sea level rise uh, globally. It melts, uh, but it doesn't affect the, the height of sea level. The thing that causes sea level to rise is the melting of ice on land uh, that melts and flows into the ocean. That's like dropping a new cube of ice into a glass of Coca-Cola. Um, so, uh, you know, those are points that I think we can find some agreement with in, in the current uh, debate, um, Senator in Inhofe and in the Senate uh, notwithstanding. Um, so points of disagreement, of which there are lots, uh, and I'll try to... Uh, show at least my view of, of uh, the state of the science on some of these points of disagreement. Uh, but there's some question as to whether the, in fact, a lot of, of, of naysayers will question uh, whether the rise in temperature is due to human activity or whether it's uh, part of long-term cycles that have gone on forever uh, un, and that uh, are unrelated to uh, burning of fossil fuels. Um, I would be the first to point out that, the, you know, this planet has been warm, much warmer than it is today in the past at various times. It's also been a lot colder uh, than it's been in the past uh, at various times. Uh, for me, what really matters is what's happened over the last 8,000 years uh, that we have been living in organized society with city and culture and language and money and trade uh, and agriculture. Um, and that's been a period of remarkable climate stability. And so I think that's the baseline against, we, against which we need to compare uh, the changes that are going on. And I'll uh, show you a little bit uh, of that uh, tonight. Uh, so that's the game plan. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I guess we might as well get on with the show here. If the lights, uh, somebody will uh, cut down the lights just a little bit. They uh, don't need to all be off. Um, and let's see, page. Yeah. Okay, so 
Carbon dioxide's rising. Uh, this is, I think, the, the best long-term evidence of that, derived from ice cores, this, this one from Greenland. Uh, so painstakingly drilled from top to the bottom uh, in cores that are roughly, uh, you know, the size of four-inch PVC, brought back to the lab, sectioned into hockey puck-sized pieces, uh, melted in evacuated containers, and the bubbles of air that are released from any given level then become a, uh, a historical record of what carbon dioxide and other gases uh, was at different times. And so this goes back to the year 900 AD, uh, goes almost up to the present. The reason it doesn't go all the way to the present is the top of the core uh, is typically not uh, totally cemented shut. Uh, you know, that's fresh snow. There's still exchange going on with the atmosphere. Uh, this is carbon dioxide parts per million by volume. And of course, here's a couple thousand years of uh, Earth's history, and the carbon dioxide was uh, roughly 280 parts per million, some variation on that uh, year to year. I don't know as I make too much of that because measuring something at parts per million level is not easy, particularly in a bubble uh, that's extracted out of an old ice core. Uh, but uh, no question about it that be about the time of the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide began to rise uh, very steeply. Uh, today, well, it's basically up here. Uh, the global level is about 400 parts per million uh, in Earth's atmosphere today. So, uh, you know, this is a dramatic change in something that was reasonably constant from a geochemist's point of view for a long period of Earth's history and uh, most of uh, society uh, as, we, as we know it. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, most people will agree that that's pretty uh, irrefutable evidence that car carbon dioxide uh, has risen. Okay, so then you can say, well, what's the relation of that to temperature? <clears throat> uh, Mike Mann at Penn State and others have uh, perfected a way of reconstructing the temperature of the planet uh, quite a ways back in history. So this is another, uh, here's 1,000 to uh, A.D. To, to the present. Um, and this is reconstructed uh, Earth's temperature. And they do that by looking at tree rings and the isotopic composition of the oxygen in the cellulose and tree rings I'll go into more detail later if you want, but that varies as a function of the temperature during the growing season that that tree uh, experienced. And of course, the way we know that weather, you know, day-to-day -day weather uh, and year-to-year -year weather is variable, there's a lot of variation up and down every year uh, in this kind of record, but uh, for all intents and purposes, that was uh, a fairly constant uh, measure of Earth's temperature, maybe even slightly declining again until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, you'll note uh, the reason this is particularly nice is the thermometer was invented about here. Um, and so the only way to get this length of record is to have uh, what we call a proxy, something that uh, substitutes for the thermometer. And these tree ring records are very nice for that. Uh, over here on the right-hand side of the graph, you'll see that the blue line that from the tree ring record is uh, closely in correlation with a red line, which is the record from the mean of weather stations around the world. So that's where you have enough weather stations uh, and good enough records uh, to actually have a direct measurement of Earth's temperature. And the point there is that those lines coincide uh, uh, almost exactly, and that gives you some faith in the reconstruction of this back uh, into time. And the thing to look at that, of course, I mean, there's been periods when the Earth was reasonably cool and uh, periods when it warmed up at the end of those cool periods, and then periods when it's been reasonably hot. Uh, but you look at what's gone on in the last 150, 200 years, uh, there's really no precedent for that in this 1,000-year uh, record uh, of Earth's, uh, Earth's temperature. Uh, both the uh, speed of the warming and the level that we've gotten to uh, are unusual in a 1,000-year period of Earth's history. Uh, and you can uh, extend this record backward using some of the ice core uh, data uh, and see that basically for 8,000 years the temperature of the Earth was reasonably constant, year-to-year -year variation, but uh, uh, constant over decadal or millennial periods, uh, followed by this uh, sharp uh, rise. You know, correlation is in science not, it's useful to infer causation. It's not taken as direct, positive, solid evidence of causation. Uh, but the correlation between these two is striking. Uh, and the change in the last couple of uh, hundred years 
is certainly unprecedented in the length of that, that record. Uh, we can go to the a little bit more familiar uh, period of time. So this is Earth's temperature from 1880 uh, up to the present. So we've even got last year there, which was the warmest year in the entire record. Um, and you'll see the annual mean with the, the black squares and the five-year running mean uh, in the red. Um, and of course, you can look at that and, and see that's basically for 100 years. Uh, Earth's temp and, uh, that's all part of the Industrial Revolution. The Earth's temperature has been rising. Did it rise absolutely constantly at a constant rate? No. There were periods when it was flat. Um, and you can see one of those in the 1950s. You can also see it in the last 10 years. Naysayers pay a lot of attention to that. Say, how can you talk about warming being related to rising CO2 and it's been flat for uh, the last 10 years? Uh, my argument for that is, you know, we are going to expect from our knowledge of climate and climate models that the temperature of Durham, North Carolina or Chapel Hill is going to be warmer in July than it, than it was in January. There's going to be an upward, upward uh, trend in that temperature. I think it would be hard to get people to disagree with that. But will it be a constant upward trend every, every day uh, during that period? You know, no way. There's going to be a, 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 maybe a week or a few days in April uh, when it cools off. And we don't throw out our understanding of seasons and the tilt of the earth and the movement of the earth around the sun because of a few cold days in April. Um, we ha are reasonably confident that it'll be warmer in July than it was in January. Uh, the same way we can look at this and not throw out the model of rising uh, temperature of the planet uh, driven by CO2 uh, that will not be a, a straight line, but it'll have these flat periods in it uh, and then resume its march upward. Uh, so I don't put any particular stock in this 10-year period. I look at the decadal averages here, that five-year line, and to me, um, looking at something at the global level with the kind of variation that climate has from all kinds of different uh, causes, the fact that that has a constant uh, trend upward over that 100-year period uh, is uh, truly striking. Um, you can, uh, I, I'm a bird watcher, Lisa and I are both bird watchers actually and have a good time uh, doing it. We've been out scouring the countryside here uh, most of the time we've been back this winter. Um, and I like to think about the birds as being an independent thermometer for us. Uh, so I had a student a couple of years ago when I was up at the Cary Institute uh, go back through the bird club's record uh, for various species of birds looking uh, for when the earliest arrival of species uh, was recorded in any particular year. Uh, and she did this for 44 species uh, that we picked, uh, not at random, we picked 44 species that did not spend the winter at all in Millbrook, New York. Uh, and so we knew they were gone and then we uh, used those as, you know, when did they first show up? Uh, and these records went back 123 years. Uh, this is tree swallow. This is, I won't bore you with all, 100, uh, all 44 of them. Uh, this, this is the day of the year, so that's January 20, that's February 10, that's basically the 1st of March. Uh, tree swallows weren't, here, weren't in Millbrook, New York at all before about 1910. The record does, you know, they just didn't get there. Uh, but they started arriving as a spring uh, migrant breeding, breeding uh, in the summer, and in the whole course of that record, their arrival has uh, it's moved forward. They're arriving earlier and earlier. Uh, every year. So I, you know, if you don't believe in tree rings, if you don't believe in thermometers, the birds are telling us it's warming. And it's not a constant, you know, the birds have good years and bad years. It's, uh, again, there's hiatus and then there's a, a, a march uh, along there. Uh, one of my favorite uh, graphs to talk about, uh, in a, it's one of my favorites because it's from some work John Christie did. Um, and he's one of the, the dominant uh, visible uh, climate change deniers in the, in the popular press. But these are his numbers. Uh, so there's a satellite that goes round and round the Earth every day. Uh, it's up there now going round and round. It's been replaced a couple of times and cross-calibrated. It's called the microwave sounding unit. Uh, this is a record of a, the 20-year. It, it looks down on the surface of the Earth and records the temperature uh, that's, that's below it based on the infrared radiation uh, moving upward. Uh, I like it because if I was thinking of taking the body temperature of a planet, um, I'd like something that's sort of backed off and is looking down at that planet from a distance and trying to get an integrated average of a large area. But what's he see? Uh, here's uh, scale areas that have gotten colder or in the blue, areas that have gotten warmer or in the reddish. Uh, vast swath of the northern hemisphere 
uh, over the U.S., over Scandinavia, over Siberia, uh, showing about, uh, uh, what, half a degree centigrade, about 1.3 uh, 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 degrees Fahrenheit over that 20-year period. Similar swath down here across uh, the southern hemisphere. Strangely, you know, not every place has gotten warmer in that record. Uh, Antarctica actually itself got a little cooler. Again, that's, there's a detailed uh, argument for why that may have been uh, that I'll go into later. But uh, you can look at that and say, that, well, gee, that's pretty uh, impressive evidence that the northern hemisphere, particularly high northern latitudes, uh, has gotten warmer. And one of the things that you should remember when people talk about global warming, remember carbon dioxide traps outgoing radiation. Radiation is trying to leave the surface of the earth. So the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is most easily seen during periods where it's the outflow that dominates the radiation balance. So when is that and where is that? It's at night. In other words, in, uh, nights to now, uh, nights uh, today and nights in the future are much li more likely to be warmer than nights in the past than the same comparisons at noon. It's during the winter, you know, in January when uh, the radiation balance, you, know, you may think there's no radiation anywhere if you uh, live where it's very cold, but the radiation balance is dominated by outflow. Carbon dioxide blocks that outflow. So winter, winter particularly winter nights, will show greater change uh, today versus the past. Uh, and high northern latitudes, where uh, high northern and southern latitudes, where uh, the dominant radiation balance over the surface of the Earth is, is dominated by outflow, and that's what carbon dioxide uh, blocks. Um, and of course, that uh, high uh, warming in the Arctic is what has caused these dramatic uh, losses of sea ice over the Arctic Ocean. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, there's some hiatuses, but that's a pretty nice linear trend for a global phenomenon. Uh, and that means there's less and less of the Arctic Ocean covered by ice at any given time. And this is thought, and I think has very good evidence, to reinforce the degree of warming because snow is reflective. And if you have a lot of it, that reflects incoming radiation back to outer space, the ocean that's exposed when that sea ice melts is much more absorptive of incoming radiation uh, and is likely to therefore warm up and persist in that warmth uh, late into the fall and, and uh, inhibit the re regrowth of the sea ice pack uh, during the winter. Uh, so sea ice is telling us something about that and you know you think about uh, positive feedbacks where the warming begets more warming. Uh, the loss of sea ice certainly falls into uh, that arena. Okay, now everything I've shown you so far is based on somebody's measurement. It could be a thermometer, it could be a satellite measure, it could be a tree ring cellulose. Uh, this is the first, it's probably the only uh, slide I'll show you. It's not the only slide, but I'll tell you the, the, when another model comes up. Uh, this is a model of uh, future uh, Earth climate. The projected Earth temperature in 2020 to 2030, that decade, uh, compared to the last 10 years of uh, the previous century. Um, and uh, again, uh, places that are projected to get colder and blue, no change in white, uh, increasing warmth in the deep, deep orangish brown. <coughs> Big swath of warming uh, predicted for the high northern latitudes almost identical in placement to where we're already measuring with John Christie's satellite measurements uh, the warming at those latitudes. Uh, warming comes on over the, uh, over the southern hemisphere, particularly over Antarctica. We lose that cooling trend. Uh, relatively little change uh, at the equator. So the global uh, warming phenomena will not be equally distributed on this planet. It's much more likely to be seen at the poles, much more likely to be seen uh, during the winter, most more likely to be seen at night. Those will, those will be the times uh, that it comes up. And all those have uh, things that play out in the policy world and what you might want to do about it. Okay, now uh, Lisa and I got a chance to go to Antarctica. We're moving into the effects part of this talk. Uh, anybody they whoa, um, what did I do? I pulled the plug out. Um, now I probably hopelessly screwed this up. Um, no, it came back. Ah, excellent. Um, anybody gets a chance to go back to uh, go to Antarctica, uh, take it. Uh, we'd go back in an instant. Uh, 
you know, you see a lot of penguins. But the important thing about going to Antarctica, or for us in studying Antarctica, was to look at some of the things that that high latitude uh, melting um, has, uh, is doing. Uh, so this is the, uh, an ice shelf, the Larsen B ice shelf, January 2002. Uh, focus on that point of land there. Uh, here it is a couple of months later, same point of land. Uh, this, which is roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island, um, has uh, fragmented and fallen into the sea and produced thousands of icebergs. <coughs> this is ice that wasn't supported by water before <coughs> and now um, is uh, floating in, you know, so it's going to add to sea level uh, rise as it, as it melts. Um, and you can look at an ice sheet like that and see if some of those have been there 10 and 20,000 years. This is not something that's happened uh, frequently. Uh, during the course of human uh, societal history. Uh, this is an unusual phenomenon. The, the ice pack uh, can be dated back uh, that uh, long. Um, and so we know that this is kind of uh, something that's been brought on uh, in recent years. Here's Greenland. Greenland, of course, melts during the summer uh, every year, not all of it. Um, it uh, used to melt back in the, well, what do they got here, the, the uh, can't see that 1992. Um, so it always it always melted along the edge. Uh, in the summer melt in 1992 uh, exposed what's uh, mapped in pink there. <coughs> the summer melt in 2006, 2005, and 2006 uh, is melt, melting back or melted back uh, over both the the uh, pinkish color and the orangish color, uh, so that the central ice pack uh, was only that large. Um, and, uh, you know, Greenland is, every year, snow accumulates at night, and uh, accumulates during the winter, uh, and builds up, and then it melts back in the summer. So you have this oscillation of what's gone, what's come back. Uh, but we're progressively marching to more going, less coming back. Uh, and, of course, all that is a net transfer of water from ice uh, into the world's oceans. Uh, perhaps six meters of or 18 feet of sea level rise will uh, come of that if it all melted. Okay, this is particularly for the legislature of the state of North Carolina. People have been measuring uh, sea level rise for 100 or so years. Uh, this is mean sea level in millimeters. Most of the time they uh, record this uh, by looking at uh, the, the harbor master at various harbors, uh, looks at a staff stuck on the dock at the end of the, end of the dock and uh, records either the every day's high point or low point, um, and uh, this has been done for, you know, decades for uh, around the world. Uh, this is the, the trace of sea level rise, <coughs> and you can look at that and say, gee, we can put a line through that and suggest that the average rate is 1.8 millimeters per year. That's non-trivial in, in and of itself uh, in terms of a, a rate of sea level rise. Uh, but I think more reasonably, you can look at that, and uh, you can even begin to see the beginning. It looks like it was slower uh, at the start, maybe speeding up uh, more recently. So if you whip that line out and uh, do this over certain periods of time, uh, sea level rise rising at about 0.8 millimeters per year uh, in the early part of the last century, uh, coming up to a rate of about 2 millimeters per year through the middle of uh, the last century. Uh, and recently going to about 3.2 millimeters per year, um, which was the rate that was uh, thoroughly dismissed by the, you know, outlawed in the state of North Carolina to talk about it. Um, and, you know, you can say, well, gee, that's, uh, you know, why can't people see this? Uh, and I'll have some philosophical thoughts to end with um, that uh, tonight. Uh, it's important to also think about, you know, these are recent decades out here, 1980 to 2000, this high rate of, uh, sea level rise. Uh, during that period, NASA has had a satellite go round and round uh, the Earth all the time, every day. It's up there now, just like the microwave sounding unit. This one looks down and measures the height of sea level to millimeter, better than millimeter uh, accuracy based on the amount of gravity uh, it senses below. It's wonderful technology. Uh, and uh, But it's only been up there since 1980 or so. Um, so the question is whether that's the, the harbor masters with their staff gauge uh, reporting 3.2 millimeters per year, um, you know, with measurements off the end of the harbor, uh, how that agrees with the satellite. And you can put uh, a line through this and see NASA gets 3.5, a little bit higher 
Uh, it's not good. There's been periods, uh, this is an El Nino where uh, sea level uh, rose and then fell during, uh, during the onset and, and retreat of that El Nino. Uh, and so there's variations that affect the record of sea level. But again, uh, no question, it's uh, long-term decadal averages. It's going up and it's going up uh, as measured by satellites looking down on it or harbor masters looking out at it. Um, and uh, you know, you can, I've had conversations with people that will come and say, Bill, I, you know, I, I like your talk, but I don't believe this global warming thing at all. I said, well, do you believe in sea level rise? Eh, yeah, I have a beach house in Florida and I worry about sea level. Well, where's the water coming from? Um, and that, then usually they want to refill their drink. Um, <laughs> So uh, here's the state of North Carolina. Ben Poulter over at Duke uh, put this together 10 years ago, actually. It's a wonderful map. It shows the amount of eastern North Carolina that will be inundated uh, in the uh, dark blue uh, with a third of a meter, about uh, 10 inches of sea level rise, and then the amount that will be inundated with a, a full meter of sea level rise. Um, even the even the less uh, dramatic scenario is alarming. The Outer Banks kind of disappear, and you know Beaufort and all the places people like to go, uh, they're going to be wet. Um, what year is that? What's that predicted year today? Uh, late in the century, uh, 2075, I think it was. I want to check that, but it was. You know, it's not tomorrow. It's oh, no. it's it's playing out over the course of the century, but it's it's playing out over time. That if you were buying a beach house and figure your family enjoys going to it now, and you want to leave it for your kids or grandkids, you know, it's not a long-term investment. Uh, uh, depends on how old you are, I suppose. But um, okay, so uh, I I want to spend a little time uh, talking about this. Well, climate obviously determines where things are uh, biologically. Uh, what grows where, how, how well it does. Uh, some of those things are directly important to us, like food. Um, and some of them are important to us, like uh, disease vectors and the like. So I want to uh, kind of give you a little whirlwind of that. Uh, I don't want to get into tonight whether you like your organic crops or whether you like organized uh, agriculture that looks like this. Um, so we'll leave that argument aside. Um, I'm going to predict that it's fair fraction of the world's food is going to be produced in organized agroecosystem ecology uh, in the future. And so it's interesting to talk about uh, how climate change might affect that. Um, and this is one of any number of graphs that I could have brought in uh, to show you tonight. The distribution of the corn earworm uh, today, essentially, or maybe in the year 2000, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, this is uh, the colors here, uh, dark red. Corn earworm, occur, uh, earworm occurs 25 out of every 25 years. Okay, so that's a heavy infestation area. Comes down to blue where it may only occur uh, one year out of 25. Um, and that's sort of just the way you'd uh, in measure the intensity of its occurrence. Uh, here we are in uh, 100 years later, um, and uh, uh, you can see that essentially the corn earworm has marched up uh, northward as the climate is warm. And, you know, look in particular the state of Iowa where, where more corn is growing than anywhere else. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, basically got the blue there, and I pulled the cord out of here again. <laughs> so we'll have a little intermission. Um, but you can look at that, and those graphs have been put together for any number of uh, food crops, and about the only food crop of global significance uh, that doesn't show a decline in yield or major changes in range is rice. Um, and of course that's interesting because there are certain countries that grow a lot of rice and depend on rice uh, and you know, they're probably less interested in climate change based on their food supply. Uh, but corn, wheat, soybeans, all the all, three of the big four um, show these kinds of increased pestilence. Um, and you can say, well, you know, we've been ingenious before and uh, hit them with pesticides. You know, we have corn earworm, we, we come up with a pesticide that kills corn earworms. Probably could do that. Might even get a genetically modified crop that would resist it. Uh, but all those will be expensive and there'll be a change in lifestyle and a change uh, that many of us uh, would be worried about. Same with forests. I've spent a lot of my uh, years looking at forests. One of the trees I want to talk about tonight is hemlock. Uh, hemlock is attacked, attacked by what's called the hemlock woolly adelgid which forms these kind of white, fuzzy, uh, uh, 
growth looking things on the bottom of the leaves. Uh, hemlock, this will be hard for some of you in the back to see, but the range of hemlock is shown in this cross uh plot here. Uh, and the current uh, area that's below uh, 28.8 degrees centigrade, the, okay, this is, I gotta be a little more careful. There. The adelgid is knocked back by cold winters, okay? Below uh, minus 28.8 centigrade. The adelgid can't handle it. And so where you have very cold winters, um, hemlock, you know, so when it's cross-tashed and gray, hemlock should be able to persist there because it's in, within the range and it has a very cold winter, at least one night that kills off the adelgid. Whereas hemlock here in the, uh, Virginia, southern Pennsylvania, cross-tashed but out of the gray, uh, that's highly vulnerable to the existence and occurrence of adelgid and gets knocked back. But the important part of this graph is that the area that experiences those cold nights now, plotted in gray, will uh, contract markedly uh, to simply the orange color up here. Uh, so hem hemlock is gonna be a species in northern Maine uh, and up here in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, maybe northern Michigan. Major change in a species that has a very important history in the U.S. as a forest species. Uh, as a result, of warm temperatures, particularly in the winter, allowing the adelgid to persist and attack the hemlock and, and drive uh, hemlock out of existence. Here's sugar maple. Uh, in green is where sugar maple occurs. It now occurs all over the eastern U.S. Uh, these uh, blobs here are simply uh, Smoky Mountains Park and Shenandoah Park and a park here in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, this is the projected occurrence in 2100. Uh, sugar maple essentially lost uh, down here in North Carolina and in, in the Deep South uh, and uh, of lesser productivity, uh, in other words, lighter green as you move north. And if you take, you can do the, in fact, there's a couple of uh, papers that show this for all the species of any importance uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, and if you put those together, uh, you get these wonderful maps. Now, don't try to read the whole scale here. Even in the back of the room, you can look at that map and see there's a red area, a green area, and a bluish-yellow area. The red is sugar maple beech forest. The green is oak hickory forest. And the blue and yellow is uh, southern pine of various types. Okay? So, and this is today's distribution of dominant canopy occurrence of those species. It's not saying that sugar maple doesn't occur down here. In fact, we just saw that it does. But it's not a dominant canopy occurrence in, in, down in the southeast. Much more likely to be oak, hickory, uh, or one of the pines. And down here at the bottom is what's projected for late in the century. Sugar maple's essentially lost uh, as a dominant canopy component uh, from the northeast and midwest U.S. Um, oak hickory uh, dominates everywhere. Uh, many people say that may be associated with an understory of uh, frequent burning, even an oak savanna. Uh, notice all the people that have planted pines widely in plantations down here in the coastal plain. Um, you know, think about a long-term business decision. May have been the wrong area. Pines are going to be the dominant canopy uh, trees out here in the Mississippi Valley and uh, the like. Um, and so, again, major readjustments of our forest cover upon which the timber products industry uh, depends. Uh, and which determines a lot of the price of saw timber and pulp and paper and the productivity and uh, corporate uh, welfare of, of those uh, timber products companies. I'd like the, all of them to have a plant ecologist on their board when they talk about this kind of thing. I don't think any of them do, um, but uh, that's besides the point. Uh, a little bit on human health. Uh, the, uh, this is the distribution of malaria today. Remember, malaria is spread by mosquitoes. It's one of uh, several uh, diseases that's spread by what we call insect vectors or animal vectors or zoonotic vectors. It, all those terms appear in the literature. Uh, this shows the distribution from high risk to no risk of malaria across the earth today. Uh, so, well, you know, if you're traveling in South America, you get malaria uh, prophylactic shock, shots and similarly in, the, in various tropics. Um, if you associate the distribution of malaria today with the climate today that controls the length of the growing season, the temperature of the water, 
uh, the availability of surface water, all of which control the distribution of the mosquito. And you drop down on the earth the future temperature distribution of water, length of the growing season, and therefore the future distribution of the mosquito, uh, brace yourself. Um, that uh, is the projection of where malaria uh, may very well occur in the future. You know, this will be a non-trivial po possibility uh, here throughout the eastern U.S. and in large... Uh, Probably, well, it's it's the, the, yeah, it's a it's the change in the probable change in the risk. It's a combination of the, uh, of the the two qualifiers. So no change in risk is uh, in these light uh, colors, um, and the doubling of the risk is in the darkest uh, brown colors. Um, you can show, and uh, graphs have been published similarly for dengue fever. Uh, for Lyme disease at the Cary Institute, where I uh, just come from, uh, Rick Osfeld and his co-workers have very nicely shown uh, increases in Lyme disease uh, that are related to climate changes going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, I think we should look across the suite of uh, human uh, diseases that affect humans and the epidemiology of those and expect uh, that those may very well increase. Now, you know, there are those who say... Uh, don't believe in global warming, therefore I don't believe in anything you said about forests, food, disease. I'd say we know you agree CO2 is rising. Direct effects of CO2 that we need to be concerned about. The first is to realize that when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, the water becomes more acidic. This is why Coca-Cola dissolves things, essentially. Uh, I guess beer would too, but... Uh, you know, th things that have uh, liquids that have carbon dioxide dissolved in them are more acidic. Uh, the more carbon dioxide there is, there is, and that's exactly what's happening to the ocean. Uh, there's been any numbers of studies. This is the pH of ocean water. The scale's over here on the right, uh, but the pH pH of ocean water has been steadily declining. In this case, in the entire northern Pacific Ocean over the uh, several decadal decadal period. You look at these numbers and see 8.2, 8.15, 8.10. You know, it doesn't look like much of a change, but that's a logarithmic scale. Um, so the, the total amount of acidity in the, in the water has uh, gone up by about 30% over the, that period of time. Uh, this is the rise in carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere and the rise in carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean water. So the rise uh, in those two, you know, very nicely inverse mirror image of the increase in acidity. Now, why would you care about that? Uh, it turns out that if you look at the calcification rate of uh, the shells of mussels and oysters, uh, things that I'm fond of in a lot of the uh, coastal uh, economy of North Carolina and the Gulf Coast uh, depends on. Uh, so here's the pH of ocean water. It gets more acidic from right to left. Um, and the re relative rate of calcification of mussel shells and oyster shells uh, both show these declines, uh, reaching essentially no uh, possibility of calcification, no ability to build a shell of any variety uh, at about pH 7.5 uh, or maybe 7.6. Um, so we're sliding down this line, uh, all of which will interfere. Direct effect of CO2, no warming here. Carbon dioxide dissolving in the ocean, the ocean gets more acid, and these organisms that lay down calcium carbonate in their shells and depend on uh, not terribly acid waters to do so, uh, we'll be able to do that less effectively um, and are likely to disappear. Uh, there's a paper that just came out in February by uh, Natural Resources Defense Council scientist uh, Ekstrom uh, that shows one of the most vulnerable areas of this acidification, vulnerable in the sense of the waters getting acid uh, and the shellfish uh, being sensitive to it, is in South eastern uh, North Carolina, kind of essentially from Wilmington up to, up to uh, Beaufort and, and Moorhead City uh, and the like. So it's right, this is close to home. Uh, back when I was uh, on the faculty at Duke, we ran a big experiment that some of you may have read about in the paper called the FACE experiment in the Blackwood Division uh, when we exposed large plots of forest to high carbon dioxide experimentally. I won't begin to go into what percent of your 
uh, contribution to the Treasury Department went into this every year. Uh, but it was very important research. Uh, and uh, you can uh, these were uh, plots that had high CO2 and then replicate plots that were in every way the same uh, without CO2. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, I mean, a lot of the plants grew better at high CO2, um, but the plant that did the best um, was poison ivy. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just a little bit better. Uh, it was growing 71% faster. Uh, this is the control plots. These are the high CO2 plots uh, over the course of that experiment. And if that isn't enough for you, so the plants were bigger and growing faster at high CO2, the amount of the allergenic compound in the leaf uh, also increased. Uh, and that's the stuff that, of course, gives you the dermatological reaction. Um, so you can, uh, my point here, I mean, the world's not going to live or die by on the abundance of poison ivy, but this is one of many species that nobody talks about. They all say, well, rising CO2 is going to make the crops grow better and the trees grow better. Nobody talks about the fact that it's going to make weeds grow better and poison ivy grow better. And it turns out that opium and some of the, the uh, drugs that we worry about and spend billions trying to eradicate are remarkably uh, responsive to high CO2. Um, and so there's a whole flip side uh, of things that are going to grow better that uh, are not going to be particularly useful uh, in that regard. And, you know, that needs to be in the list of effects. Hay fever suffers. It's just beginning this year. My wife has already been, you know, looking for the Claritin. Um, you look at ragweed uh, response to high CO2. So here's ragweed growing at 280 parts per million, 370 parts per million, 600 parts per million. Uh, the grams of pollen per plant, the, this graph is basically those data, uh, and the allergen level uh, associated with that pollen. Uh, from 280 to 370 to 360. Uh, this is just one of a class of uh, allergenic uh, productions by of allergenic uh, substances produced by plants uh, that are documented to increase uh, with high CO2. Um, so a little bit about what to do and then some uh, philosophical comments about why we're not doing it. Um, and uh, my first thing about what to do, so there's, uh, I want to focus just on two areas here. We're all, every, Probably everybody in the room here drove here tonight. So everybody's concerned about liquid fuels. Um, you know, it was not gasoline. Maybe you came with ethanol or something else. But uh, the, the uh, availability and the uh, usefulness of liquid fuels from getting one place to another, uh, there's just no question that this is a, a dominant part of society. Air, air travel would essentially cease without uh, liquid fuels. Um, and so what to do about liquid fuels uh, that contribute carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and despite the drop in grass, gas prices are limited in extent uh, at some point on the plant. So we've got to think about some substitutes there. Uh, and so this is all, it compares everything to gasoline. Gasoline would be right along the zero line there. Uh, here's a couple of alternatives that are really bad. Uh, producing liquid fuels from coal. You know, that produces, that produces carbon dioxide at more than 100% of burning gasoline alone. And a couple of others that are not so hot. Here's one that's really good, cellulosic ethanol. That's not ethanol from corn. This is ethanol from basically plant waste, stalks, uh, straw, uh, grasses that are growing uh, specifically with their ethanol. The problem is that the enzymatic reaction to produce ethanol from cellulose is very inefficient right now, and I'm going to make a prediction that the, the biochemical engineer that works that out is going to be a very rich person uh, because it, it uh, you know, releases so much less uh, carbon dioxide uh, per unit of energy compared to gasoline, and, it, and, and if the enzymatic process uh, becomes effective, there probably could be a lot of it, um, and it would be a way of maintaining the, the kind of transportation infrastructure we have today uh, without changing the climate. Um, and then there's a suite of them here. But see, corn ethanol is that one. Um, so it's slightly better than, um, than gasoline, but not dramatically so. Um, and its impact on food prices and the food uh, cost for the developing world is not to uh, be discounted. Okay, so the other one that I think interests all, uh, us all, and particularly N.C. Warren, 
uh, that's worked tirelessly on uh, both the nuclear power initiative and coal-fired power plants and the like uh, is where we get our electricity. This slide is being shown with electricity tonight. The lights in the room. You know, this is another thing. We, we you flip the light switch, you expect the lights to go on, uh, and people are not going to get over that. So if we're going to have to figure out a way to do it without adding carbon dioxide and other uh, bad things to the environment. Um, and uh, so Lisa and I, uh, you know, not having any kids, we did things that uh, yuppies do, um, and it's it, experiment with uh, alternative ways of of generating uh, solar power. So this is our house in Durham. Uh, in uh, 2005, we put 2.7 kilo, kilowatts of uh, solar panels on the roof. Then we moved to New York. Um, we've come back, but today, this morning, we went and visited the new owners of this house, and they uh, seemed to imply that the panels were working just fine, and they were uh, getting a really high uh, production of their summertime electricity uh, off the roof. Uh, but being a good science nerd, I, of course, had kept all our bills. Um, and this was the average power use per month in kilowatt hours per day. Um, and this is pre-panels in the red um, and then uh, after the panels in the green. So this, is what, this was our draw on Duke Power. Um, and uh, if you sum those all up for the course of the year, um, we were getting about 35 or 40 percent of the power uh, off of our roof uh, without adding carbon dioxide, appreciable carbon dioxide. Uh, to the atmosphere in that sense. Um, so I'm a huge advocate of solar power. We've put them up uh, in the house we've built in Maine. We now have a array that's a roughly uh, three times the size of what we had on the roof there in Durham. Um, the jury's still out um, as to how they're doing up there. I, I know for a few days they were covered in snow. Um, but uh, we have high hopes for that, and I think this is going to be the uh, wave of the future. I've seen some uh, very important studies uh, that have addressed how many years does it take to pay back the debt of manufacturing a solar panel. Because when you manufacture a solar panel, you mine metals, you mine silicon, uh, you fabricate the panels. All those things are energy-intensive uh, processes, and then you build the panel and, and, and mount it somewhere. Um, so how long does it take to pay that, pay that back? Uh, it looks to be about a year and a half. Um, and that, you know, that to me is, is super, and it's dropped uh, dramatically uh, in the last several years. So you're into the, you're into the black uh, pretty quickly. Okay, so now that's it for the slides, but I want to end with a few uh, philosophical comments because, you know, I've been at this for 30 or 40 years, um, and I listen to the debates in the Senate, and, you know, I just say, you know, what's happened here? We're no farther along. The science is absolutely solid. Uh, the vast majority, more, more scientists agree that carbon dioxide from humans is linked to uh, rising temperature of the planet than, uh, was, than doctors agreed that cigarettes cause lung cancer. I mean, we have a better consensus on this than we did in uh, the late 60s uh, with uh, the tobacco industry. Uh, and yet, um, you know, the good senator from Oklahoma is a, throwing a snowball around on the floor of the Senate talking about if it's this cold in Washington, this, is, uh, this climate stuff has all got to be a bunch of hooey. Um, so, you know, let's compare it back to tobacco. People smoked uh, cigarettes. Uh, it was clearly a toxic substance. I remember my dad blowing cigarette smoke through a handkerchief, and you could uh, see that brown uh, spot that it left behind. He gave up smoking finally. Um, but, uh, and people knew, you know, people died of, of lung cancer in real time. Almost everybody knew somebody that had, had died of it. Um, so, you know, here we are talking about a gas that's building up slowly in the atmosphere. It's odorless, colorless, non-toxic, uh, compared to the, uh, controversy over tobacco. That's a, that's a tough road. Oh, people have a tough time believing that something that's odorless and colorless and playing out over a century uh, is going to be of much concern to them. They'd be concerned to their children and grandchildren, but the, you know, that the reality of if you smoke that cigarette, you're going to die, the carbon dioxide issue doesn't have a poster child that's quite uh, that good. I think that's one of our problems. Um, second problem is almost the flip side of uh, landowner rights. Yeah, this country really grew up with... Uh, this land is my land, and I can do on it what I want to do on it. Um, and uh, 
the atmosphere and the waters of the oceans, you know, they didn't belong to anybody. So that was a place where you dumped stuff you didn't want. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's that philosophy that you can do what you want on your own land, uh, you know, drill an oil well, uh, build a factory that employs people in a high carbon dioxide industry, and nobody can say, no, you can't do that. Uh, and you blow the CO2 into the atmosphere that doesn't belong to anybody, and it circulates around the planet and warms the planet everywhere. I think there's a problem philosophically uh, that is probably maximized in this country that the, uh, that these, the, the commons of the planet, the oceans and the atmosphere, are where you dump things, and you can get away with it. And people shouldn't regulate that. In fact, it's you know, the big argument about uh, not regulating it. Um, then, I, uh, I mean, this sort of goes into what I call libertarianism on this. Um, the libertarian approach uh, to environment, uh, that we shouldn't be regulated, uh, is really trumping the science. I, I actually think the problem with why we don't do anything uh, very significant or very fast on the global warming issue with the breadth and depth of the science available is that the science is it's losing a vote not against uh, science that disagrees with it, of which there are very, uh, very, there's very little, but it's losing a vote against uh, a libertarian view uh, of the world, that there's another valley for the Marlboro Cowboy to ride into and it'll be green and you, know, you can throw your cigarette butts out there, put your CO2 in the atmosphere, everything will be fine. And that argument basically trumps the science. People don't want to lose that. Um, and uh, when I look at uh, the, the corporate world acting as individuals uh, don't want to lose that. And when I watch the debates that go on in the House and Senate and the state houses and the state Senate now, to me it's not so much a debate over the reality of climate change. I mean, the science gets crucified in the process, um, but it's really a debate uh, of whether people want to give up a libertarian right uh, to pollute the global commons or whether they want to take what I would say would be the sapiens of homo sapiens view uh, and preserve that commons for the future society including their kids and grandkids um, and that's the argument we have to do so i want to close tonight but you know groups like nc warren do a great job uh, getting this word out each and every one of you can do a great job by i mean we, we've all got neighbors that lean over the fence and tell us that they don't believe in global warming i even got some relatives like that um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've got to work on those folks. Um, and, I, you know, I, it, NC Warren and the other N NGOs are doing a great job, but they can't do it all. Each and every one of us has a job to get out there and uh, say that, in fact, no, that's not the case. It, the science is real. You've got you've to come on board with this um, and, uh, and stop polluting the global commons. So let me stop there. This has been fun. It's been fun to be back to this group. I see some old friends out in the audience, and it's always fun to see old friends coming back. Um, but uh, onward to battle on this issue. Uh, the battle is not lost. It's a, it's a tough one, uh, but we can, uh, we can prevail. So, again, my name is Jim Warren. I'm director of NC Warren. Um, I really appreciate everything uh, Bill Schlesinger was, was conveying with us, uh, and, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about how we've got a kind of a, an ironic um, collaboration with the libertarian mentality that, that is working in our favor. But I, I want to recap a little bit here. It's clear that climate change is a very serious problem. Everybody here came out tonight, I think, because you realize that. Doesn't it make you crazy when you continue to, to read in a, a periodical or, or hear uh, somebody say, talk about it as something that's uh, sort of relegated to just our future? I mean, it's on us here. And people are suffering all over the world. They've got food security, water security issues, um, terrible weather extremes that are harming people. The ocean acidification is already having impacts on people's food supply. So we've got a global weirding situation and it's going to continue to get worse for a pretty good while no matter what we do. But uh, many of you know we are facing a situation with feedbacks that creates momentum 
for the warming and um, a number of, of prominent scientists have called what we are facing right now a planetary emergency. So we don't have the luxury to just continue to go at a step-by-step -step pace. We do need to, to do what we can individually and, and at our homes and with our neighbors, but we also have to get organized. And I appreciate the, the kind words that, that Bill said about NC Warren. I want to tell you briefly what NC Warren's strategy is. Many of you know it, but uh, for the last eight or so years, our primary focus has been North Carolina's role in trying to ad address climate change. And everything we've been seeing uh, over that period of time has amplified the need for us to get serious here in our backyard because international treaties are important and national activities are important, but we see the dominant corporate interest that has delayed and distorted the need for action on this planetary emergency. We were talking uh, earlier, most uh, other countries are populated by people who understand quite a lot more about this planetary emergency that we are facing, and many of them are living it in a lot of different ways. Here's something many of you might not know. There's one corporation that claims that it is the largest electric utility, corporate utility in the world, and it's anchored right here in this state, Duke Energy. The News and Observer checked out that claim and they found that it was correct. This was about two years ago when, when Duke started claiming that. So our strategy has been for quite a long time wrestling Duke Energy into the clean energy revolution. Um, if we can do that, <laughs> if we can do that, it could be a very positive tipping point and a global game changer. It won't, their, Duke Energy's direct actions won't decarbonize enough on its own, but if a, an entity like that quits dragging its corporate feet and joins all the other positive things that are happening, it really could make a giant difference. Um, so we are working to change Duke Energy's business model. Their biz business model is quite simple, it has three prongs build power plants, raise rates, and use your corporate influence to distort and stymie the public debate by taking bags full of cash to politicians and giving away money through targeted philanthropy to silence and squelch public debate. They've been doing it for many, many years. Progress Energy, before they joined forces, they were doing it too. We've exposed a lot of that over time. And I know that sounds controversial. Some people will think, well, why don't you just, let's stay positive here. Look, this is a political fight. It's not enough for us to do what we can on our own. We have to be organized and work together. And there are some very positive trends. NC Warren and Allies have had a number of incremental victories. We've been holding the line on a lot of fronts. We have materials here tonight. Our latest newsletter will give you a, a slice of a lot of those different areas that we're working in. Um, so we're working to change Duke Energy's business model while meanwhile doing everything we can to try to move past them. We've been fighting for policies that promote solar power for a long time. The last several years, NC Warren has been doing hands-on solar projects and helping through our Solarize NC program. Uh, that you can read about. We're having a, a good success. We are getting the word out. As Bill said, solar power is here. It's right now, it's cheaper than, it's far cheaper than anybody will ever bring a new nuclear power plant kilowatt hours online for. I promise you that. Um, and so we, uh, NC Warren, we work in coalitions. We work at the legal and the regulatory level. Our fine attorney, John Runkle, is here. We, we analyze data. We expose Duke Energy's uh, poor practices and, uh, uh, and corporate influence in the news media and through, through the public, and we organize. We're working with communities in a lot of different places around on coal ash and trying to, again, wrestle this state into the, uh, joining the clean energy revolution. I want to tell you just briefly, uh, there's a handout back there 
Because people all the time say, well, what, how would you go forward? Duke Energy is proposing uh, to build more power plants, fracking gas plants. They just completed and put online a couple of co or uh, one coal unit in this state. Um, they want to build nuclear plants, and people say, well, what, if you don't want to go nuclear, you want them to burn more coal, or you want them to, to build more fracking gas plants? And see, that's always been a, uh, a red herring argument, you know? The Responsible Energy Future handout that's on our table out there outlines it's the fourth straight year we've done this, maybe fifth, uh, where we have projected what kind of changes can be made in this state to allow us to, number one, close all of the coal-fired power plants, two, avoid building any more fracking gas plants, and, and avoid trying to build more nuclear power plants. Now, real quickly, I'm going to say, some of you I know, well, don't we have to go nuclear if we're going to decarbonize this state? Look, when the nuclear renaissance was announced by Dick Cheney and his cohorts in the electric power industry um, 10 years ago now, almost 11, many of us warned at that time, look, these companies are going to waste billions of dollars and years and years trying to build nuclear plants. They might not ever get a, get a single one built. And even if they could get a few built, they don't, we don't have the capacity to replace coal in, by, by working in that direction anyway. And uh, here 10 years later, we were right. You can see more information in, in our materials back there. The efforts to try to build our way uh, to help with cl uh, climate change, building nuclear plants, is a disaster. It's a disaster. The good news is it's happened quickly enough that the, the falling apart of the Renaissance has got Duke Energy staring at that path forward and thinking, whoa, wait a minute. We're not sure we're going to even try that uh, after all anyway. So, but in our, in our responsible energy future, we compare Duke Energy's 15-year plan that they have to file every year, and we analyze it every year, and they say, well, we've got to build all these power plants because demand is going to grow and grow and grow. We cite industry data showing the best projections that demand nationwide and in this state is likely to remain flat, I talk about energy usage, and even fall over time because people are gradually picking up on energy saving uh, programs and technologies. We uh, show that we can uh, grow energy saving programs at a feasible level. We can add renewables steadily at a, at a good pace and we can use combined heat and power and other technologies and phase out the coal-fired power plants without building new ones, decarbonizing North Carolina. More good news, uh, some of you have, have been reading about this over the last uh, couple of years, and especially now, there's quite a lot of attention happening around this, what the Wall Street Journal came on and called a utility death spiral. And it, what it, in short version, what it means is... Um, and this was reported by the Edison Electric Institute, which is the trade association for the Duke Energies of the U.S. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Edison Electric Institute warned that uh, solar and other distributed technologies are coming on so strong in the marketplace that these monopoly utilities who try to hang on to the old business model and keep their monopoly control, uh, they are facing the potential for extinction of going the way of Kodak. The former CEO of Duke Energy, Jim Rogers, many of you remember him, he has been publicly saying much the same thing. So, and some of the big utilities, other energy companies, solar industry are moving along quite well. Uh, the technologies are improving. We have battery storage technology. Tesla is moving forward into the marketplace with that. The move toward distributed energy generation and people disconnecting from the power grid is happening quite rapidly. But it's not happening rapidly enough for us to go to sleep about it. The market trends are all in our favor. The economics and the technical aspects are all in our favor. And I'm talking about our, the publics. We can move ahead without more and more and more rate hikes that are harming people in this state Every year, Duke has raised rates uh, already three times in the last few years. And so uh, 
we simply have to up the pressure at this time. Now, as I wind down here, I want to tell you something that you may have heard about, but it's going to get more attention over the next few weeks. There is uh, one of the most hopeful things happening is a bill that's been introduced last week in the North Carolina legislature. It's a bipartisan bill that promises, if it's passed, to really change the equation and allow more rapid development of rooftop solar in this state. It's, it's based on the idea of third-party sales. It'll, it, there are large companies, some of the companies that are already in North Carolina, others nationally that want to come into this state and install solar power uh, on people's homes, people across the income spectrum for little or no money down up front and then sell them the power. Uh, right now, North Carolina law per apparently prohibits that. And Duke Energy is already fighting like crazy to try to block this bill. But this is back to we have a lot of conservatives and libertarians that agree with us about the need for competition. They don't like monopolies any more than we do. We might like them less for different reasons uh, because we've been uh, up front seeing how this all goes. This bill is huge. There's a leaflet on the table Please take that. Please look on our website, ncwarn.org, and help track what's going on uh, over the next few weeks and months because, honestly, a very knowledgeable reporter told me uh, a short while back, if, if this bill passes, and I tend to agree with him, it really could be a game changer because all of a sudden the Duke monopoly, they can't suppress the competitive uh, advantages of solar power. Spread this information across the political spectrum. We've got a new poll coming out tomorrow that supports an earlier poll that some allies, a business, a conservative business group did that show that people across the political spectrum support the idea of competition and they like solar power. And there are a lot of Christian conservative groups and others now who are getting in the game on climate change and the need for clean, clean energy. We've got to get involved. Please go home on the way home tonight. Think about ways that you can get involved, get in this game, do what you can at home, but help build the, the political voice. One more quick thing. I'll tell you, there are a number of high-ranking people uh, with Duke Energy who agree with us. They are conflicted internally. They have invested heavily in renewable energy out in the western part of the U.S., and they make money at it. They've got a monopoly here. They want to hang on to it. We need your help to try to turn that back.